Welcome to Pyrotechnics, the podcast brought to you by your number one publication, Fireworks Rock and Metal Magazine. Please check out fireworksmagazine.com or firescapeofficial.com for information on our latest issue. Now it's time for the good stuff, so please welcome your host, Pete Arnett. Not yet, it isn't. First, it's time for this. Nothing like starting the show with an exclusive. That was a preview of Starlight by Olivia Daichichi, taken from the forthcoming Circle of Friends 2 album. Uh, thanks to Bruce Mee for allowing us to use that track in this podcast. Um, welcome to all you rock and metal heads. I hope you've been enjoying the hot weather that we've been having. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we've had this type of show. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the guest star editions that we've had with both West End star Kerry Ellis and rocker Tony Mitchell. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome my co-host for today's episode. Uh, What he doesn't know about rock and metal wouldn't even cover the back of a stamp. He's a walking encyclopedia about our genre of music, and he's also our deputy editor. Uh, Please put your hands together and welcome Dave Cockett to the show. Welcome, Dave. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? And also joining us is a man who has more artistic skill in his little finger than the rest of us have in our entire body. He even has his own segment on Discogs. He's that good. I am, of course, talking about our art editor, James Gaydon. Welcome to the show, James. Hello. Good to see you all again. Right, let's kick off with a subject um, that is fast becoming a bit of um, an issue, especially with bands, and I have a sneaking suspicion, especially with venues as well, um, and that is merchandise. One of the thrills of obviously going to gigs is uh, to look at and hopefully buy some uh, piece of merch, you know, from your favourite band. I know when we were young, uh, it was like a, a wearing your own stripes, wanting to get a, a, a t-shirt or something like that with your own band on it. 
And I also remember one of my favourite um, pieces of clothing was a T-shirt I actually got from a Def Leppard, t- uh, Def Leppard gig, beg your pardon. And it was it was an all over print, not just on the front or the back, but it was all over. And I wore that thing all the time, um, so much so that they had to pin me down to rip it off me to get it in the washing machine. Uh, and also recently, at the age of nearly fifty, I also got a Billy Idol T-shirt. You know, so it's not just the youngsters that look forward to buying merch; it is us oldies as well. But there's trouble brewing for some bands, and I know that um, Dave has uh, got his, uh, got strong uh, feelings upon this. So we're going to let Dave take the lead on this one and um, say. It's not all roses out there at the merchandise stands, is it, at the moment, Dave? No, it um, it doesn't um, appear to be. And it's um, certainly a bit of a thorny subject that's been bubbling away for years, I suspect, but has certainly post-COVID seems to really have come to a head. And that's the um, the subject of um, venues, promoters, actually taking um, a cut of merchandise sales. Um, now, let me say to start with, I don't believe that this is um, particularly a problem with most of the small independents, one, 200 people capacity gigs. It's when you start to get a bit um, to sort of bigger venues and can actually be quite a shock if you're um, a band that's um, up and coming that find yourself um, on a support slot to um, some of the bigger bands that play in some of these venues. Uh, and that, uh, that that can be that um, the, the venue come along and it's a right um, contract is that we take 20, 25, 30% of the um, gross merchants at merch sales. Now, we all know that um, recorded music, vinyl, CDs, etc., cetera, um, sales have plummeted. So traditionally, uh, that was a big source of income for lots of artists, and that sort of um, really tailed off. Uh, you can't now, uh, even the big bands struggle to sell in the millions. Yes, they'll, um, they'll get streamed uh, millions and millions of times, but we all know what... Um, fraction of um, a percentage of a, um, a penny per stream they get. Uh, so to sell a million streams and um, make 1,200 quid or whatever uh, the figures are these days isn't going to um, buy anybody uh, second home in the Bahamas. Um, what has come to a head of late, though, as I say, is that um, there are some of the venues and... Um, one of them is the um, Academy Group, I believe are um, not the only culprit, but one of the principal culprits. Um, whenever a band comes along to play, uh, they will come along and say, we want 20% of your merch sales. Uh, and whilst that's been accepted industry practice, um, because I think people have probably been too afraid to actually to talk about it, uh, it seems to me it, it, it's diabolical that venues and promoters are actually ripping people, uh, ripping bands off. Next next time you go to an arena show and you wonder why T-shirts cost 30, 45 quid, this is why. Uh, it's because somebody else, other than the band, are also taking their cut out of it. Um, now, it's hard enough for little bands to, um, to get any sort of tour together with a, the hope of breaking even, let alone making a profit. Uh, as we said, music doesn't term sell and make any money. When you put a tour together, you've got a band to feed while they're on the road. You've got transport to hire. You've got um, fuel to put in it. You've got potentially hotels. All those sorts of costs before you actually start thinking about um, recouping anything. Uh, the only traditional way um, really was to, to or to at least supplement any sort of income and offset any sort of um, loss on the tour was to sell merchandise. We all know we've been to um, gigs, we've bought T-shirts, we've bought CDs. Recently, increasingly, people seem to be buying vinyl, although I still think that's a um, uh, uh, flash in the pan that um, will soon um, die down when people get fed up of paying 50 and 60 quid a chuck. Uh, But... You you think you go to um, to the back of the gig, you meet the band perhaps, or you meet the merch guy, you hand over your 20 quid and you get your T-shirt. You think, yeah, this is supporting the band. Well, yes, some of it is, but the actual amount of money that they're getting out of it, when you to look at pressing costs uh, or printing costs, um, and then everybody else taking their cut over and above that, um, is a lot less than you expect it would, would be. Now, I, I ask you, is it morally 
right for somebody to say, right, you can use our venue, we'll charge you, I don't know, two grand to use the venue to put your, sh your, your gig on. Uh, we'll guarantee you a crowd of 500 plus people. Um, so they, they think, yeah, we'll, we'll ticket prices are set at X. Well, you look at who, who gets a quarter of the ticket price. These days, it's people like Live Nation, like Ticketmaster. Uh, not only do they charge you the 40 quid for the gig ticket or whatever, they'll slap you with a 10, 15, 20% fee on top of that. So you're paying fees on top of ticket prices to start with. For them to then come along and say, oh, and by the way, to the bands, anytime you sell any, you, you want to sell some merch in those venues, you're going to have to give us a cut of that as well. Now, what, what, where, where's the fairness in that? Uh, they've covered the, they should have covered the costs of the venue higher in the first instance um, by saying that to the bands this is how much it'll charge you will charge you to hire the place. Uh, they've also then got um, all the bar sales and things like that. Them say that they themselves um, bands don't get a cut of bar sales. Uh, should they get ten p a pint that goes over the um, the counter before they play? Uh, so it it, re it really. Re the more I read about it, the more it pisses me off. Uh, and when you look at um, the likes of Academy Music uh, Group that do charge these, and we all we all go to gigs at the academies because there's basically bugger all else um, of that size venue to go to these days. But they're getting a cut of uh, bands uh, merchandise. They've had no input to it. They've had no cost um, sunk into putting this stuff together. Yet they're just creaming off the top. We then get. Um, Excuse me. Um, as I said to you before, is it is it something that's they've got away with for long enough? Uh, is it something that's um, become more prevalent post COVID because everybody and uh, everywhere seems to be hiking the prices to um, to make as much money in as quick as space of time as they possibly can? Um, and how do we stop it? Do we stop going to gigs? Do bands stop going, um, putting on these gigs in these places? Um, I, I I did read somewhere, I forget who the band was now, um, wasn't particularly a band from our genre, but the, uh, the example serves. They were told that um, when they got to the venue that they would have to um, pay 20% of the gross um, profit on merch uh, or the gross, uh, the gross turnover on merch, to say. So they, if you sell 100 quid's worth, they'll take um, 20 quid, regardless of however much you put up the front end. Uh, so the band turned around and said, you know what? No, we're not going to do it. What, so what they did is that they uh, arranged something with a local pub uh, about 10 minutes walked away and sold the merch from there, uh, which to me seemed like a bloody good idea and an up yours to the venue. Uh, and the more and more people that start to do this, um, the more that, um, that this sort of um, reprehensible behaviour uh, should be brought to light. It's disgusting. It really is. It, it, it's everybody trying to cream off more and more money from people who are actually artistic and um, there to entertain people. It's business. It's bo it, bottom lines. It's about that, how much money they can screw out of people. And they don't care who they screw it out of just as long as they get uh, and their cut and then some. Uh, it's disgusting. It's time it's stopped. Very true, very true. Uh, James, um, obviously taking on board what Dave said, you know, do we think now that it's it's worth bands exploring alternative options or even just saying we're going to sell online, we're not going to bother bringing any merchandise to any gigs whatsoever? Definitely, because as Dave alluded there, you've got the venue charging for you to be in the place in the first place, which the promoter is getting involved in. The bar sales... Then there's usually the one a percentage of the door for people who haven't bought tickets in advance. And then they want the merch as well. And you're like, where's it, where's it stop? The merch is nothing to do with the venue. The merch is there for the people who come to see the gig. And the, the venue are getting for that because they bought the tickets and they're using their bar. So they don't need to be getting involved in the merch as well. And that idea that Dave said about going to the local pub down the road, that's a great move. And I know an artist I've recently designed some merch for, and he's selling via his website before his shows so people can wear them to the gig, and he's getting the money directly. That, again, is a smart idea because then it cuts all that bother out. He should be able to sell stuff at his own gigs, but not if it's going to be costing him to do it. That's ridiculous. And it's, it is, it's more 
musicians do need to be aware that these things can be negotiated. If they're not that experienced, a lot of them will go, oh, right, right, okay. Some of them with a bit more nous or a bit more clout will say, no, we're not paying that. You can have this. And they'll, you know, maybe it comes to some sort of agreement. But a lot of them are too timid or not knowledgeable enough to do that. A lot of musicians will freely admit they're not business people. They're creative people. Yeah. They don't come into it with this sort of mindset of, oh, well, the overheads for this. They just want to go and play. And most people just go and want to see them play. But there's this little group who just wants to cream, like Dave says, as much as they can for as, as little effort as they can. And it's another example of the music industry sort of destroying itself. We've seen, like Dave pointed out, album sales have gone down. It used to be you made an album, you toured in order to sell it. Then it became, well, you make an album to go on tour because touring is where you make your money now. And now it's like, well, you can't even make money touring, so what's the point? And that's only because people are getting greedy. And it's not the artist being greedy, it's everybody else. So playing devil's advocate here, um, do we think that, you know, have the venues got a right to charge this kind of thing, to say to bands, we're going to do this? Have they got a right to look out for their own interests as well? Not, you know, obviously they've got overheads, they've got bills they've got to pay, they've got um, stock they've got to put in for, for people to drink or eat, et cetera, et cetera. Is it a just a pure greed move from the, 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 the venues or, you know, are they just trying to cover their own backs? I think it's a greed move. Um, I think if, if, if not, not talking about the little independence where you've got this run by one guy or run by a couple of people, we're talking about big companies here. We're talking about companies that run venue. Um, Academy Music Group aren't run by, um, they're not individually run by a vent- uh, teach venue by a little guy um, sat at the back in a flat hat, um, taking tenors off of people on the door. They're, um, they're run by um, business people. Follow the money. You look at um, Academy Music Group. You look at who the biggest shareholder is. Live Nation. They own more than 50% of um, Academy Music Group. You then follow the money a little bit further. You look at one of the biggest shareholders in um, Live Nation. It's Universal. One of the big record companies. Um, who have got the finger in that many different pies. So they're getting a, a, a percentage cut of... Um, everybody's business at these venues, um, including artists that aren't even signed to Universal. Um, You go even further that, look at who's um, the the, the big shareholders in Universal um, are. My understanding from um, what I looked at earlier, there's um, there's about 30% of it owned um, that's got some sort of French interest. So not only do they own a bloody electricity, they own all our music now. Um, So these are people that are multi-billionaires. Uh, so it, it just beggars belief that they, they that they would just they're happy to try and cream off the top of somebody else's creativity. Um, as, as as we all know, if you're a little band out on the road, you sell ten t-shirts tonight. It might mean that the band eat tomorrow. Um, if you if you um, say, well, we've got a, a quarter of that's got to go to um, somebody else. What what happens is the drummer don't eat tomorrow, the vocalist don't eat on Wednesday. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous, and it, it, it's it, it's once again it's the it's the it's business destroying the creativity. It's business that business is there. Let's let let's let's not beat about the bush. Business there is to make money, whether they're selling your goods or services. Don't give a toss what it is, uh, whether it's um, gaming, whether it's um, holidays, whether it's um, whether it's washing machines or whether it's going to gigs. Uh, it's all the same. It's a product that they can package up and that they can sell you for as much as they can possibly get out of it. Um, it but th- this, to me, it seems like... Um, it, it, it's almost like the um, insurance they used to try to sell you at Curry's um, for when, when you bought a new toaster. I remember go- I remember going into Curry's once, buying a kettle for 10 quid, and they asked me if I wanted to take out um, protection insurance, which was going to cost me 50 quid for five years. So I said, no, if it goes, I'll buy another fucking kettle after the guarantee runs out. This is exactly the same sort of thing. It's just them trying to cream off, yet again, more and more money. It's the rich, rich getting richer while the rest of us can go screw ourselves. Absolutely. And it, it pisses me off. Classic example, when you said about the, the handling fees and stuff like that with Ticketmaster, 
you go and buy a ticket on Ticketmaster, you pay the price, which is usually extortionate, then there's a price on top for a handling fee when you're printing it at home yourself or putting it on your phone. Who's handling anything? Nobody. So what's the handling fee for? It's just extra money they expect you to pay, and it's yeah. ridiculous. And as Bruce has alluded to in the past, if I, that gig gets cancelled, you'll get refunded the price of the ticket, but not all these little fees. You won't get refunded that. So it's just it's a scam as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And it is it's pure greed because I did um, a job recently for a local promoter who's put on, putting out an album for this artist and he hired me to do the artwork. And I had a meeting with him and the artist, the artist told me what he wanted for his album cover. I designed it and he was like, right, great. So yeah, if you come and play a showcase gig, the bar tab will pay for James. And that was basically, it was all worked out, you know, he'll do a showcase, help sell some CDs, bar tab will basically pay for my tab, all nice and simple. And then you switch that up to when I've done some work for Michael Ball, where Live Nation get involved, and they turn around and tell his fan club, you can't produce any merchandise from Michael Ball on because we earn all the rights to that. Yep. Oh, well, we was just going to produce like a little calendar for the fan club. No, you can't. We earn the rights to that. Are you going to produce a calendar then? No. So what's the point of that? Well, we earn the rights. Well, good for you. But right now you can't do anything because it's up to... How many calendars do you think you'll sell? 500 at the absolute most. Yeah, well, we earn the rights, so we aren't doing it. It's just, you know, what? what's the point of that? Uh, just for the impartiality as well, I must point out there are other places as well that you can buy kettles from, not just curries. Um, just, to, just to say. <laughs> <laughs> We have a couple of quotes here because um, we've been in contact with uh, a friend of ours that's been on the show before, Greg Hart, who's obviously uh, Cats in Space, who are doing a tour. Go and see it. Very, very good. Uh, we, and the question that was put to him was actually by Dave, who said, what are your thoughts on venues, promoters taking a cut on sales at band, of band merch sold at gigs? And this is his response. Um, I will leave the swear words in because it does actually add the emphasis that I think that Greg was asking for. And his answer was, I feel that all teams involved in any show need to make a profit and cut of a show short. But taking it from the band's merch, who are probably at club level making precious little from the gig fee after their cost is scandalous and short-sighted. There ain't the money in record sales anymore, so why squeeze bands further on their own stall? Many bands will give up and die if they can't at least salvage some profit from their merchandise to keep them on the road. How can they survive? The game is fucked up enough, isn't it? Everybody needs to wise up in this industry sharpish, seriously. And I think that just shows, because, I mean, obviously, Cats in Space, they've taken a very lavish tour, uh, set out and touring, and, and, you know, they, they're doing well. They've, they've, they've come up with a plan of their own. But as I point out, it's not just, you know, small bands, it's medium-sized bands, big bands that are also, you know, going to suffer with this, and, you know, something does need to happen. Um, there has also been quotes as well from the uh, Featured Artist Coalition, uh, that, uh, as Dave rightly points out, has warned that some venues charge about 25% of the band's um, merchandise uh, totals, which is absolutely scandalous. And the CEO, David Martin, apparently told Sky News in an interview, uh, it's been a complete perfect storm over the past two years. European touring is very difficult and has become much more expensive post-Brexit. Lockdown has seen most artists suffer from the drying up of their touring income and we're also facing a cost of living crisis. And this has a real impact on consumer confidence, which impacts ticket sales as well. It's really simple, Mr. Martin explained. 100% venues is about removing punitive commission fees, which are charged for the sale of artists' merchandise at venues. Lots of fans don't realise that when they pay for a T-shirt or a CD or a record at the gig, often the venue will take a cut of that, and there can be up to 25% plus VAT of the gross. There's an idea that artists are famous and that on stage they must be very rich, but even at quite a large level, there's a great deal of cost involving in touring. I mean, if it's affecting people, let's be fair, like, let's say Ed Sheeran, um, Dua Lipa, people like that, who are very, you know, popular at the moment, and lots of young fans will go and see them, that bands like Cats in Space and probably people even like Iron Maiden, Alice Cooper, they're going to be suffering as well. You know, it just isn't right. And so, you know, as the guys have said, this has to stop and it has to stop now. As far as I'm concerned, if you pay the ticket, you're paying to see the band. And that's what the venue are getting their money from. The merchandise is nothing to do with them. They shouldn't have any input in that whatsoever. It's just greed. Agreed. So, Dave, what is the ultimate answer? The, the ultimate answer is 
it's, it's, it's a difficult one because not, nothing's going to change overnight. A situation like this that's so complex isn't going to change overnight. Ideally, you want a, a, a new company that comes along that says, right, we take, we'll take part, uh, charge of this. We'll sell everybody's tickets. We'll book everybody's venues. Um, and we, we'll take X for doing so. Now, I remember um, first time I ever went to the NEC, which was probably the old NEC, um, to see a gig, which was probably about 150 years ago or something like that. I remember ringing up and booking tickets. Tickets probably to see somebody like Scopes or whatever um, back then. That might have been 29, 30 quid a ticket, but there was a 50p booking fee, and that included and posting the buggers out to you. Then along come, was it Keith Prowse? They were the first lot, um, because they got panned for it. They came along and then they started charging booking fees on top. And it, it seems to have become the the accepted norm now. And it, it, it's one of those things, it's, we, we've become a bit numb to it. Mm. it. It's almost like the exact thing about people in illegal downloads not paying for music. We've kind of become a bit numb to it because it's accepted practice. But it's wrong, absolutely wrong. And un unless somebody can come along that says, right, we'll cut all these people. It's like Spotify. That's another one. If, if we could get somebody that comes along and say, OK, we'll host your tracks. We'll get subscribers on at five pound a month uh, and we'll pay you 10p every time one of your songs gets um, played. But it's getting from that altruistic ideal to where we are now is a long and thorny road. And let's be honest, we start taking money out of these people's pockets wholesale. They're not going to just li um, lie back and let's do it. They're going to kick up a stink uh but as i said follow the money ultimately from where your pound goes uh to who's getting the most out of it and you'll find that it's concentrated in um a few hedge funds billionaires or whatever's pockets so they're they're just coining it for doing fuck all while the rest of us um are spending our hard-earned incre increasing amounts of our hard-earned to go and see a gig um, to buy a CD, to buy a book, to buy um, a T-shirt, whatever to do with the music. Um, something's got to give. Uh, and I think ultimately, all it will do is hasten the demise of um, the so-called music industry. I don't think that people will ever stop playing music. People will want, always want to play music. People will always want to be creative. But the idea that you could make a career out of it is probably now as far away as it ever was with Wondering Minstrels back in the medieval times. I mean, one of the other things as well that the FOC, uh, the FAC, beg your pardon, have uh, done is they've made a list of venues now that don't charge or won't take beg your pardon, a percentage of merchandise uh, profits. Uh, I mean, that's possibly something that we need to start promoting, obviously, and the artists as well, by saying we're only going to go to these venues, and hopefully it has a knock-on effect of forcing other venues to, you know, review what they're doing and hopefully knock off these charges. Um, the thing about uh, Ticketmaster and its various add-ons, I think, is a, is a discussion for another podcast because that is something that, uh, as, as you guys have rightly pointed out, does boil blood quite a lot, um, especially when there's cancellations involved. Uh, but this merchandise thing has got to be looked at, and it's got to be looked at soon. And as I said, we've heard from Greg Hart, who's part of a band. We know what his inside take of it, and probably that is of many bands as well. My only fear is that, as you rightly pointed out, Dave, this is not going to be a quick fix, and we're still probably going to be having this conversation in possibly five, six years' time, um, which, yeah. is a, which is going to be a shame. It certainly is an emotive subject. Um, it's probably going to be hotter than the weather outside uh, if we if we keep on going with it, because... Uh, I think there's lots of things we could say and possibly none of them are very good when it comes to these kind of venues, but we need to move on. Um, so hopefully we'll get sorted out. Hopefully um, people will start to take uh, pay attention and look at the list that the FAC have put out as well. And hopefully we can start getting some of these bigger venues to sort of pay attention by saying, no, no, we're not going to come and visit you anymore. We're not going to let the band, you know, the bands aren't going to come and visit you and sell merchandise and, like you said, James and Dave, hopefully the local pubs down the road will do a better trade as well. If uh, if bands sort of taken on that kind of route, you know, it's a good idea. So let's hope they uh, they continue doing it. It's kind of related in some way, um, and 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 it, it 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 was something that the artists did that um, that I, I thought, yeah, if you could get enough big names involved in this situation, you could actually do something. But um, the last time I went to see Iron Maiden, they Ticket prices were reasonable, um, but there, there was always a problem with touts. Mm. People buying um, 
book tickets and then flogging them at inflated prices. What they'd done this time is that they, they Maiden had actually took them on. They'd actually um, they, they'd restricted the number of tickets that people could buy. They'd not sent them out until something like 48 hours before the um, the shows. Uh, and, and by doing that, they reduced touting significantly and by significantly 85 90 percent plus now if that can that sort of attitude and approach can be transposed onto something like this maybe then this can be um, addressed as well yeah. that's just it's just something that struck me well yeah it'd be like a venue boycott wouldn't it if enough bands yeah. as we are coming there and that again to tie in with cats in space they've decided let's try theaters instead of where we used to play Theatre's not necessarily going to be coming along going, oh, we want 20% of your merch. It's not what a theatre does. So it might open the door for some of these lower level bands who don't clout of an Iron Maiden or an ACDC or whatever. That might be some route they can explore, definitely. Well, there we go. Ideas flowing already. Um, let's see what happens. Right then, it's on social media, so it's got to be true, doesn't it? There was an interesting article, online article, um, I don't think it was a printed one, that was in The Guardian, uh, that says, 30 bands you've got to see before you either die or they split up. And it said, this is you had to go and see these guys, regardless of who you liked, what kind of genre of music you liked, uh, this kind of thing. And I read this list, and there was about five that I agreed with out of the 30. Um, I have no interest in seeing Taylor Swift, either before she dies or I die, or... <laughs> <laughs> Half the other bands as well that are mentioned, Dua Lipa, I think was another one. Um, uh, there was Iron Maiden, I agreed with that. There was ACDC, I agreed with that one as well. Uh, um, in fact, funny enough, the rock and roll ones are the ones that I agreed with. But half the other stuff, um, I've certainly got no wish to see Oasis or anybody like that. So I got to thinking, right, I'm going to challenge the guys uh, today to come up with 10 bands that they reckon that we should all go and see before we die or they split up. Or I have this feeling that if they're our age, they may die first, I don't know. But basically, we've got to go and see them before they disappear. So I'm going to start with James with this one. Um, and James, go on. Reel off your list of 10. Who have you got? Right, 10 bands. I mean, th th there's lots of great bands and artists, but if it's a, a case of bands that aren't going to be around for much longer, uh, Aerosmith, I'd definitely throw them in there because a legendary band who have made some brilliant records, and they can still cut it. Maybe not as great as they were a few years ago, but still pretty damn good. They're not going to be around much longer, so they would absolutely be on my list. Um, the same would go for Kiss. I know they're doing currently the longest farewell tour in the history of concerts, but <laughs> um, they do put on... Even though Paul's voice is not what it once was, you <laughs> always get a great show with Kiss. If you've never seen a Kiss show... You need to see a Kiss show. I think they would be, if you've never seen this, you must, they would probably be top of my list. So I've been very fortunate. I have seen Kiss, but if you haven't, do it before there is no Kiss, or at least no original Kiss. I know they talk about, oh, we might do it with new people. Well, I don't give a toss about that. If it's not got Gene and Paul there, it's not Kiss. So see it with Gene and Paul. See it how it was meant to be done. They're definitely on the list. The Who would be another one. There's only Pete and Roger left of the originals. And as uh, Roger Dolce says, if another one of us cacks it, we're calling it a day. So I would say <laughs> go see them while you've got the chance. They're currently touring with an orchestra. So if you want any more reason to see them, there you go. They're playing, I think, all of Tommy with an orchestra plus a shed load of their other massive hits. And again, really good live act. So Definitely go see them. One that I've always wanted to see that I've never seen would be the Doobie Brothers because they're one of my favourite bands and I've never had a chance to see them. And they don't come over here very often. But every time I've watched one of the live DVDs, listened to one of the live albums, they've just been phenomenal. I just imagine that that is a hell of a night out if you get to see the Doobie Brothers live. So that there will be a bucket list gig for me. I would also throw in... The Winery Dogs, if you've not seen them. Because for one of the more current bands, I know that all all the guys in the Winery Dogs are experienced and established musicians, but they've only made three albums. But every time somebody goes to see the Winery Dogs, they're blown away by how good they are. 
these three guys can make that noise because they're that good. It's like, you know, you're not going to find many bass players better than Billy Sheehan. You're not going to find many drummers better than Mike Portnoy. And you're not going to find many guitarists or singers that are better than Richie Cotson. And they're all in the same band. So, and especially with me, like in Mr. Big, I know that they're planning a farewell tour, but the winery dogs sort of picked at the mantle from where Mr. Big left off for me. They've got the Cotson and Sheen connection there. It's that sort of it really good, catchy music, but with really tight musicianship. So I think just if you appreciate musicianship, you'd have to go see the winery dogs. Same goes for Black Country Communion, because there aren't many rock supergroups left, but Black Country Communion are one of them. It's worth seeing them just for Glenn Hughes, but when you add Joe Bonamassa into the mix, that's pretty good going. And they've made some really good records. They've actually got better with every every album, in my opinion. I know the first one sold well. I, th I still think that's the weakest of the set. They've got better. And when they go out, they perform live. They can, it's just guys who can do it. They don't need backing tracks. They don't need any. It's just four guys who can do it. And that's what you really want when you go to see a concert. Even though it's not quite what it used to be, I'd still put status quo in the mix. You cannot have a bad night out if you go see status quo. Yes, they haven't got Rick Parfit anymore, but they've still got a really good group of guys. They've still got Francis Rossi, and they've still put together a really good show. And you cannot help but enjoy it. It's like if you aren't tapping your feet at that gig, you're dead. There's no other excuse for it. And they've got so many great songs, and you, oh, yeah, they did that one. And it's just a really good night out. I've never, ever had a bad night out when I've seen Quo. So I'd throw them in. I'd definitely put Cats in Space on the list because there's a band who make really good albums. And as we've talked and as Greg spoke about when he was on this podcast, they've gone to the trouble of trying to make a real show for this tour. So I think the least we can do is try and go and see it. If it's as good as their albums, it's going to be spectacular. So I'm really hoping I can make one of those shows. Um, there hasn't been a Cats in Space album I've enjoyed. And since the Brian Damien Edwards as the singer, I think they went next level. So I'd love to see that live and see how it pans out. Same would go for Skid Row. I totally lost interest with Skid Row when Sebastian Bach left. But since the Brian Eric Gronwell, I think they've been completely rejuvenated. I like the album they've made with him. And the clips I've seen him on YouTube, I'm like, this kid's got it. He's really made them what they were in the first place, what, what I liked about them. And Sebastian Bach can moan and bitch about all he likes, but they don't need him now they've got Eric Gronwell. So I would go see them in a heartbeat. I think that would be a proper rock night out. And I would also add Deep Purple. Got to see Deep Purple, especially now I've got Simon McBride, who's brilliant. I'd like to see him, just see how he, how he does with them. The clips I've seen, he looks like he fits like a glove. I'm really interested to hear the album that they're going to make with him. Might be the last one, but they've said that about the last three, so you never know. Um, but yeah, I think if, you, uh, if you're if you looking to, to see bands before they pack up, you need to see any of those guys. Well, there we go. There's James's list and some impressive names, to say the least. Right then, Dave, what have you got for us? Uh, right. The first couple are um, ones that you've already mentioned, Iron Maiden. Um, if you want to see an arena metal show, you won't get a better experience than going to see Maiden. Um, they've played to everybody all over the world. They keep going, they keep, for me at least, uh, cranking out great albums. I know that, P and, that people like to have a pop these days, say that they're not what they were or they're not where you, you keep hearing the people, oh, they're not as good as they were when Diana were um, lead singer. Well, but that's just complete bollocks. They upped so many levels when Dickinson joined, um, you can't even count them. But they, they're still doing it. They're still out there. They're still making great new music uh, and they're still promoting it at shows. They're not sat on their backsides doing arena um, cabaret shows like a lot of bands do. Uh, so may, definitely go see Maiden. The The next one will be ACDC. Whether we'll ever get to see ACDC again or not, I don't know. Um, it's been a couple of years now since the album came out. Um, we There may be a limited, another limited run. Um, if you get the opportunity again, they just know how to put on a show. 
Um, it's, it's almost like quo in some regards. You know exactly what you're going to get. And as James said, you go see ACDC, you're not going to come away without a smile on your face. Um, I'd also throw Alice Cooper into the mix. Alice is, Alice is the ultimate showman. Uh, you, you, you cannot um, go without being impressed, scared, horrified. Um, going to see Alice, he's, he's just brilliant. And yes, we, we've all seen him be hanged. Um, we've seen him be uh, beheaded. Uh, we've seen him stab um, dolls. We've seen him also do all sorts of um, silly, crazy things. But he's just great at it. He's great. He, he knows what it takes to keep an audience uh, mental from beginning to end and just delivers time after time. So I would always still go and see Alex. One that James might find a bit contentious, I'd go see Queen as well. OK, Freddie's not there. Um, John Deacon's not there. But any opportunity to go see Brian May and Roger Taylor, um, take it because, again, they're not getting any younger. Um, might not be the, um, he, he, he's not Freddie, but I don't think that they could have got much of a better um, front man than um, Adam. So AC, uh, Queen would certainly be on the um, the list. Now, the next one um, might surprise some people, but I'd put Europe. Um, I've seen Europe on every tour, I believe, since the final countdown. Um, and... Again, whilst it's now on a smaller basis to what it used to be, uh, they always put on a good show. They've got a great singer. They're great musicians. They keep producing great albums. Um, so they're always a band um, that I get excited to go and see. Uh, then the Dead Daisies. Now, I know we've had a change of vocalist again. Um, Glenn's gone. Uh, I saw him a couple of times with Glenn. Uh, and John Karabi's back. I saw him more than a couple of times with John Karabi. Uh, but the, the, there's an energy and a vibe about their shows that lots of new bands don't seem to be able to capture. There's just something about it. Um, they might not have recorded some of the greatest songs that you'll ever hear, but when you actually put those guys on stage and they start rocking it up and locking to that groove, it's just brilliant. Absolutely incredible. So go see the Dead Daisies now before they start charging you 95 quid the tickets to go and get an arena seat because that's where they're headed. Um, after that, um, I would say uh, Uriah Heap, simply because they've been going for 200 years, uh, still keep going, um, still keep delivering. They're always put on great shows. They never got the sort of breaks that get them talked about in the same circles as Purple, um, Led Zeppelin or Black Sabbath from back in the 70s. To me, they're just as good. Uh, so I would always go um, and say, go see your right heap, uh, because, again, you're guaranteed um, a great night's nice entertainment. Um, and Mick Box never stops smiling. Uh, uh, he must have had it tattooed on his face at some point in the last um, 70 years, because it's always there, whatever, whenever you see him. Um, the last of those, the, the, the bands, uh, or the eighth on my list, the last of the ones that are on my list that I actually have seen is Thunder. Um, Thunder are the quintessential blues hard rock band to see. Danny is arguably the finest vocalist of his generation to me. Uh, always has been. Um, I know that um, of late um, the, the, there was his accident and there are questions as to when he'll be back on stage uh, again. Uh, he's recovering slowly. Uh, which is the, the, the best way with the injury that he got um, to actually recover. Uh, I'm sure that they'll be back. Um, I, I don't see that you'll be able to keep him off stage. Uh, but if you've never seen Thunder before, go and see him because they're brilliant. Absolutely great night's nice entertainment once again. The last two are, um, are bands that I've never seen, never been inclined to see particularly. But the older I've got, the more I thought, yeah, it's one of those you ought to do. Uh, one that James has already mentioned is The Who. Um, the Who I've, uh, would never have crossed my radar in my 20s. Now in, I'm in my um, 50s, you start to think, well, yeah, they wrote some great songs. Uh, and the footage that I've seen of them uh, and the stuff that I've heard, um, they always look like to be a great live band. Everybody that I know that's seen them say that they're, they're one of the bucket list bands that you need to see. So I'll put the Who on there. And then the final one, a band who never really interested me, and um, no, it's not Taylor Swift, uh, is Rolling Stones. They're still out there. 
there will be some sort of announcement, I believe, in the none too distant future. Um, and the fact that both Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are what pushing eighty, they're both eighty this year. Uh, for them to actually to get out there uh, and still be doing it, and at this level after fifty, sixty years, is is they, they, they're a rite of passage. It's almost like if you could get in a time machine, go back to seventy three, go see Zeppelin. Um, Rolling Stones, I, I think, are just one of those rites of passage that we probably all ought to go through. Uh, but like you, I, I, I have no interest in seeing Taylor Swift or the likes before she or I die. So there you go. On the uh, subject of people in their 80s still doing it, slightly out of the, the rock genre, but Tom Jones is another one. I Was one fucking of them loved, yeah, yeah, I fucking love Tom Jones. I've got loads yeah. of his stuff. And I saw him in Sheffield years and years ago, and he was phenomenal. And then I saw him, he came to Hull, which was brilliant. Uh, one of the first gigs I did um, when the lockdown restrictions were lifted. And he came out and I was like, probably be his last tour, you never know. But And he was unbelievable. And now he's out again. And I saw a clip of him. He's like, what, 83 now? And he was singing. And I was just like, he's just, there's nobody to touch him. The man's a god. So, yeah, well, if you've never seen Tom Jones, go see Tom Jones. He's awesome. Yeah, no, the, you're absolutely right. I, I did um, toy with putting him on the list. I've never actually seen him myself, but you can't... If anybody tells you that Tom Jones can't sing needs to get the fucking head examined because the guy is he's just one of... He, he's an amazing vocalist, mm. and he's still doing it. But like you say, at 83. Incredible. Amazing. What about you, Pete? Uh, Your turn. Uh, no, I'm not I'm not going to do this one. Um, but I was going to say, I'm really disappointed that none of you chaps are putting Michael Bublé. Well, I'd have thrown Michael Ball in, but not Michael Bublé. <laughs> I must admit, I think we probably had the most surrealist rock and roll sentence ever muttered in that when Dave said, we've all seen Alice beheaded, stabbed and strangled. You know, that's yeah. such a rock and roll <laughs> statement, is that, that is brilliant. Uh, right then, let us, well, do you agree, first of all, viewers, you know, listeners, do you agree with the 10 uh, bands that these chaps have come out with? I mean, there's some awesome names there, there really is. What is your 10 that you would like to, uh, to recommend that everyone sees before they die? You know, let us know. Leave in the comments below. Um, obviously, it's just a bit of lighthearted fun. We hope they all go on forever, as as um, as we always do for our musical heroes. Uh, we're going to take a break now. We're going to listen to another music track. This one is Destiny featuring Andrew Freeman, and it's from Cahill Turks and Friends' new Turkish Delight 2 album that will be coming out soon. <laughs>
Yep, and that was Destiny, like I say, by Cahill, Turk and Friends. It's featuring Andrew Freeman on vocals, and that is from Cahill's latest Turkish Delight 2 album, which should be out soon. So we're going to go to the review section now. So as you know, this has been expanded. It can cover CDs, books, DVDs. Basically, the guys can go nuts. Uh, I'm going to throw this one over to Dave to start with. So Dave, what have you heard? What have you seen? What have you read? What's interested you? In the last couple of weeks, not a lot, to be honest with you. Um, because when I, you know, go away, I go away. But uh, I have um, just taken delivery of um, Geezer Butler's autobiography. Uh, I'm quite intrigued to um, to read his take on Sabbath, having read uh, Tony Iommi's and Ozzy's. Uh, that book came out about three, two or three months ago. Um, I, whilst I was away, I read Tina Turner's autobiography, actually. That was quite an interesting story. Or a second, was it a second autobiography? I'm not sure. It um, it, it it covered most of her later life uh, rather than the um, the icon Tina bit. But um, again, she's the the stuff that she's had to um, to fight against uh, to become the icon that she did. Um, it, it's quite incredible to read about. And then the other one that I read whilst there was a way you can tell there's not going to be much music this time, Pete, can't you? Is uh-huh. that um, was was Debbie Harry? Um, I was always a bit of a blondie fan as a kid, um, like most teenage boys were in the um, the late 70s. Uh, but again, another one that's had an interesting life. Um, tells it straight, tells it how it is. Some of the stories that she um, she shared. Um, so if you were ever a blondie fan, that um, was certainly worth a read. Uh, musically, um, no, there's not, not really much that's um, crossed my, my radar, I'm afraid, over the last couple of weeks. Um, since I've been playing gadget, but that stops tomorrow. That starts um, again when we get into everything else. So sorry to disappoint you there. No, no, absolutely fair enough. I mean, books are books are equally as good. Uh, go on then, James Savers. What have you been listening to? Well, much like Dave, when we finished um, an issue, I tend to power down a little bit because we're inundated with that much new music. But there is one that I do need to highlight, and that's um, Boys from Heaven. They made an album. I came out of absolutely nowhere a couple of years ago. Uh, it was released on Target, I think it was. And I got sent it to review. And I got three tracks in. I was like, where have these guys been? Because it was lit- it tipped so many boxes for my taste. Um, they had, it's real, like, sort of smooth AOR. Immediately, you would say Toto would be in the mix. But I would also throw in, like, Huey Lewis in the news because... They have saxophone in their songs, which is such an underused instrument. Mm. And their songs were really well done and they had really good harmonies. And I really enjoyed the album. And it was it was one of those things that I'd never have heard of them if it hadn't been sent to me for review, but I'm so glad it was. So I raved about it and that was that. And they've just made their second album. And I listened to it and a lot of bands say the difficult second album. This is just more, more of the same, really. Really well Crafted songs, good vocals, more saxophone, and produced by Eric Martinson from Eclipse, which is no bad thing. Um, I'm not entirely sure what he brought to the party because it sounds much like what they were doing anyway. But um, whether he's helped them streamline their song selections or what, I don't know. But it's another really cool, laid back, just classy record. So, yeah, and that's out now. So, I'd definitely give them a try. So, Boys from Heaven. If you like saxophone, sort of 80s, just cool pop rock, I don't think you go far wrong with these guys. Just just thinking of, just thinking of one to throw a spanner in, then it's uh, the complete opposite end of the spectrum. New Metal Church, it's a very good album. Um, I've got that to review for, for um, this forthcoming issue. Uh, I'm hoping to set up an interview with them as well, with Kurt Van Der Hoof. Um, always one of the, the, the bridesmaids at the thrash party, really. Never considered to be one of the big four, although I I, I think that they're just as good as the likes of Metallica and Megadeth. Um, the, 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 they've always been intelligent. It's never just been heads down, let's see who can make it to the end first um, with Metal Church. I mean, if you've ever heard the debut, they did a cracking cover of Highway Star. Well, that's um, that's by the by. Uh, but the new one, it's, it's, they've got a new um, singer in. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the last guy died a few years ago. So they've got a new singer in now, and um, it, it sounds just like classic metal church. There were times that um, I, I was reminded of um, the Dark, which was their, to me their classic album, 
uh, but it's um, it, it's definitely well worth uh, um, a listen. Uh, and I think I think that's just just out now actually. Uh, I was really hoping you guys would have more than that because I've put on my list since the issue's been out. I haven't done a lot of listening to music, so that's probably <laughs> me right up on this segment, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> right, so, well, that's the uh, thing. We all work so hard on the issue. When it's finished, we all need a week or two just to go, oh, before it all starts again. Oh, uh, exactly. I mean, I have listened to a couple, so, you know, I, I've got a few to throw into the mix. But actually, before we start, and this is probably one of the weirdest things we're ever going to say on a, a rock and metal show, but an absolute massive shout out to Rick Astley for his rendition of Highway to Hell at Glastonbury. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but he actually, when he first started, he was actually a drummer. So he played the drums while singing Highway to Hell. And if you get the chance to see it, I would do it. It's an amazing version. It really is. We've we're, when we're off air, we're just talking about Glastonbury actually, and the, a lot of bands have been slated for this uh, for their performances. But one of the artists that come out with um, a lot more cred than he went into was Rick Astley. I mean, he's obviously been very derided in the past with the Rick Rolls and all the um, the memes that have been coming out where you you press a link and obviously you get uh, Rick singing. He's never going to give you up on all that malarkey uh, as a, as a practical joke. But to be fair to him, he absolutely smashes Highway to Hell out of the park. So if you do get the chance to see it, go and see it. Um, I'm sure it'll be on social media all over the place. It was that good. But two albums I want to mention. The first one is one that I was sent um, to review, and it was a guest that we had on last time, and that was Tony Mitchell's uh, Radio Heartbeat. And if you haven't heard any of Tony's work, he's um, very much AOR. He's he's very smooth. He has a very queeny kind of sound. Um, and sort of various other artists as well around sort of like the Queen genre as well. His songs are fantastic. He writes them all himself. Um, and it's just one of those albums, you know, you kind of get an album where you get home, you've had a stressful day. You just want to put something on. You want to relax to it. You don't want to be bothered with, you know, something too heavy and something too beaty um, kind of thing. And it's one of those albums. It really is. So that is out uh, in July. Um, so Go get, get yourself a listen. Uh, there's a couple of tracks out on Spotify at the moment. And uh, I think Dave's going to probably shake his head at this when I mention the next one's actually a um, band that comes from Frontiers. Um, and it's uh, it's Chaos Magic uh, featuring Katrina Nix. Uh, yeah, there we go. The eyebrows raised already. I'm in trouble. Um, this is actually an EP of theirs that they did uh, 2020, I think it was. It's called Desert Rose, which it's um, it's actually four covers. It's four songs and it's four covers. And Desert Rose uh, being Sting's version. Um, there's Faith No More's Ashes to Ashes, Bruce Dickinson's Accident at Birth, um, and Duran Duran's Ordinary World. I knew the Bruce Dickinson one would get his interest again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I said, Duran Duran, um, Ordinary World, which they are absolutely brilliant covers. Um, some songs there that obviously lend themselves to sort of symphonic metal. Um, maybe some that don't, i.e., stings and Duran Duran's, but she does a really, really good version of it and she does a very, very good job. Um, I say it's only an EP, uh, I don't think you can actually get it on Amazon anymore or places like that, so you would have to hunt around for it. But it's on that dreaded Spotify and Amazon and iTunes um store, so you know, do have a listen, it's not actually half bad, right. Now, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when we last did a podcast, I've challenged them to build their own band. And we did vocalists last time. And um, James went with Jolyn Turner as his lead man. And Dave went with, um, a pr in his prime, David Coverdale. So this week, it's lead guitarist. Um, so let's see who they've picked. James, I'll go throw this one over to you first. Who is your lead guitarist for your band? Paul Gilbert. Because the lad can play anything, and he can write songs, and he can sing. So there's not a genre Paul Gilbert can't handle. So I'm having him as my lead guitar player because whatever songs my fantasy band come up with, he'll be fine with. <laughs> okay, dokie. Okay. Right, Dave, who have you got? Um, assuming that um, we're looking um, at a fantasy band that can um, cross... The death barrier. Uh, my guitarist would be Gary Moore. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. to, to, to echo what James said about Paul Bill, Gilbert being able to play anything, uh, Gary Moore, multiply that by 10. The guy could make that guitar sing. Um, so any any band, Gary Moore would always be my lead guitar player. Okay, so the bands are growing. Let's see next week uh, or next time we do it, who, who else the guys have picked. Let's go over now to musical mishaps. Now, this is obviously the bits where it's funs and fails. 
and it shouldn't really happen to an artist uh, kind of things. Um, first of all, we're going to do the questions. Um, so the last podcast, I asked uh, the audience, which legendary guitarist worked in a bra factory as a sewing machine mechanic? Before I give out the answer, do either James or Dave know the answer to this one? I don't. No, can't say I do. He came from ACDC. Okay. It was Malcolm Young. Nice. Indeed. Right then, chaps. So question for you two. Elvis Presley recorded more than 700 songs, but how many did he write? I say zero because he was never known as a songwriter. He was always, he was always um, singing other people's songs. That would that would be my my, my honest answer. I mean, whether he actually ever did get involved in writing or not, I don't know. I mean, uh, why would you? I'm Elvis. Give me a song. I'll. So my, my answer is none. I do like Elvis, and I think he did write some, but not many. I would say, well, out of seven hundred, I'd say ten or fifteen, maybe. Right. It's a bit of a trick question, guys, and I do apologise. Um. You're kind of right, Dave. He has zero credits as a main writer, but he does have 10 as a co-writer. Now, there is a bit of a caveat to this in respects of um, this may well be down to an agreement with Hill and Range Publishing that saw honorary credits uh, given to the musician, even if they didn't do anything to write the song. So it's entirely possible that you're right. Elvis wrote nothing that he ever sang, but he does have 10 co-writing credits to his name, which may or may not be true. Ooh. Right. So my question now to the audience, um, who has the longest running rock fan club, according to the Guinness Book of World Records? If you think you know, you know what to do. Pop your answer in the comments below. Again, James and Dave, if you want to have a stab in the dark or have a, have a guess, you know, just comment down below. and We'll see if you're right the next time we do a podcast. Right. So on to it shouldn't happen to an artist, but it does. So we've already alluded to this, but with the issues and the bad press that certain bands are getting at Glastonbury, this reminded me of two incidents uh, that have happened in the past. And one of them was um, from Metallica, thank you, pardon, uh, Kirk Hamlet. Whilst he was performing in front of so many fans, uh, it obviously puts a bit of pressure onto a band to perform well, not to hit any bad notes. Uh, but he had a bit of an issue when he was playing the intro to Nothing Else Matters. Basically, he just kept on hitting bum note after bum note. And it's so much so, he had to stop playing. He stepped up to the microphone and said, oh, my hands are so sweaty. I, um, it's really hard for me to play. I can't play properly. So he went off, dried his hands, came back on, and was absolutely flawless. The intro was flawless. Everybody had a good time uh, and enjoyed it. Um, same thing basically also happened to a group called Level 42, the bassist Mark King. Uh, came in late with his part, and so the band had already started playing the intro to a song, and then Mark came in uh, about five seconds late with his bass part. It sounded awful, totally out of time. So he had to stop it as well and said, I came in late, it happens, but nothing like an pro like me can't shake off. They started the song again and absolutely perfect um, the second time. So this is a question I want to ask the chaps, uh, and we'll start with Dave first. Um, have you ever seen at a gig a band start a song and get it so totally wrong or it just sounds so totally awful they've stopped it after about 20, 30 seconds and said, we're going to do that again? Uh, quite a few times, actually. Oh. Um, no, n there's, there's nothing that immediately um, jumps out that says that this band did that. But, I mean, it can be for any number of things. Uh, In-house monitors is um, the, the prime example. Uh, the, the number of times I've seen it where um, the, 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 the vocalist comes in and is completely off-key to the rest of the band. Um, it's th that It shouldn't happen, um, but it does. Um, so I, I can't think of any specific examples, but yes, I've, I've been I've seen a number of times where they've stopped it uh, and had to start again um, because they, they they just said somebody didn't come in on time or um, or whatever. And what about you, James? I've not seen it, but I've heard it. I have a bootleg of Sammy Hagar in 1984, and it was a radio broadcast. It's a really good show, but he gets he goes to play Two Sides of Love and the he starts the guitar intro and it's all over the place. And you just hear him go, hold it, hold it, hold it. I can't play this out of tune like this. We're going out on the fucking radio. And then he just stops. And then there's a couple of seconds delay. And then he starts up again and it's bang on and away he goes. But yeah, that, that first bit, you're like, what on earth is going on there? But whether his guitar had gone out of tune because of the weather or whether it hadn't been tuned properly anyway, I don't know. But it sounded horrendous. And he just, he was 20 seconds in, he was just like, nope, stop. And 
didn't care it was on the radio. He got it right, and fair enough. I'd rather hear it right than wrong. I said, I mean, that's the beauty of live music, though. These things do happen, isn't it? But you know, it's mm. it's one of those yeah. not one of those rare things. Sometimes what it does, it actually enhances the gig. Sometimes, doesn't it? Because it shows that everyone's just human, and you know, everyone everyone makes mistakes, and you know, like you say, usually the second time they hit it absolutely perfectly. You know, so it's one of those to stay things. on air. To stay on a, a Van Halen frontman tack, I remember David Lee Roth once at a concert and he forgot the uh, verse to uh, Just Like Paradise. And he, he was like two lines in and he just completely blanked. And he just went, quickly, everyone, to the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> well, we said before, as well, I mean, Joe Elliott from Def Leppard, he he suddenly forgot um, his lyrics as well and started singing about anything that came into his, his head. And I think they had a verse mm. about carpet fitting. You know, one of the one of the you know one of the most popular songs going, but it's it's one of those things. It just makes everybody human, but it's it's just funny when it does happen. It makes a gig very memorable. I always think. Right. Oh, we're running out of time again, so we're gonna bring this one to an end. You know, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, chaps, again. Um, Merchandise. I think again, that's that's a topic that I think we're probably going to revisit, uh, along with um, Ticketmaster and its uh, various fees it likes to add on. You know, that is obviously a very serious issue that does need to be uh, addressed. But until that time does arise, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to my co-host at the moment. I have been your host, Pete Arnett. It's been a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to say goodbye to Dave. Thank you very much for being on the show, Dave. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. Um, thanks for listening once again. And I'm going to say goodbye to James. James, it's been a pleasure to have you with us today. I very much enjoyed it as always. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. So don't forget, when you finish listening to this, go and get yourself issue 103 of Fireworks Rock and Metal magazine. It's out now. You can buy it either at WH Smith's or McCall's, or you can go online at www.fireworksmagazine.com and order it from the shop. It is an absolutely fantastic read. I mean, we're biased, we always say this, but this is probably one of the most diverse issues I think we've ever put out covering a whole load of stuff um and while you're reading it listen to the playlist 60 superb songs this time on the playlist um so book yourself a fair few hours off but it really is worth it some brilliant songs there but above all you know take care people and we shall see you all next time until then goodbye thanks for listening all views heard in this podcast are from the individual and do not necessarily represent those of fireworks rock and metal magazine